Today we're gonna to get to analyze a badge cam that quite frankly is a big mess all around. Hi everyone, welcome to today's badge cam lesson here at Active Self Protection, where every day we analyze real life uses of defensive force for making our training more evidence-based. I'm your host, John Correa. And I'm your co-host, Mike Willover. Today's video comes to us from Okaloosa County, Florida. Palm pepper spray is next generation OC spray. It's hot, hot at 1.4% major capsaicinoids. And its modular design means you can customize it exactly to you. Three different setups, lots of different color combinations. You can make it exactly as you like. And the flip top safety prevents accidental discharges. It's 10 to 12 foot range and 25 half second blasts. Make sure that you can keep that long range eye poke at long range. I trust Palm OC and I recommend it for everyone for self-defense. A sheriff's deputy here is responding to a report of a domestic um, argument happening in one of the apartments that's getting out of hand. We do have audio of the deputy's interaction with management as well as with the eyewitness. So let's listen in and hear what happens. What's going on? One. I, I'm not sure. Uh, I just was told to let her know if you guys come by. Okay. Uh, so I'm gonna give her a quick call and let you guys know. Okay. Let her know so there was a fight going on or something? Uh, that's. I was not present for that. Okay. Yes, sir. Are they fighting or something? She's saying that it happens frequently. Okay. But this time it sounded like it was getting out of hand. Okay, which door? Um, oh. well, I'm not sure. Two weeks ago I was walking by like by their apartment basically mm -hmm. on this side. And I was hearing someone yell like shoot the up, like stupid B word and all this other mm -hmm. stuff and I heard a slap. Like okay. right after it, but I wasn't sure where it came from. Okay. And I couldn't call, like, I didn't want to call the police. Like, you know. Which room is it? 1401. 1401, okay. 1401. Well, the girl sounded scared, the one that called. She said, she was like, it's getting out of, it sounds like it's getting really okay. out of hand. So it's hit number four, huh? Yeah. Okay. You mean fair? We stand out there and direct the deputy that's coming to this okay. area? It's not, you, you're going to go to the fourth floor uh -huh. and it's going to be on this side. Right? Gotcha. Sheriff's office, open the door! Sheriff's office, open the door! Step out. Drop the gun! Drop the gun! Drop the gun! 312, shots fired. Suspect down. Do not move! 312, get EMS my location. The man who came to the door had a gun in his hand. He was a young Air Force Special Forces enlisted person. He died of his injuries here, which is a, just an absolute travesty. He was apparently on FaceTime with his girlfriend. I haven't heard whether they were actually having an argument in that moment or not. None of the news stories mentions that. I've put a bunch of them linked in the description. There's been quite an uproar about this one and we'll talk about it in the lessons. 
Mike, I know that things are gonna be all over the place on this one and people's opinions are gonna be all over the place. Let's think about the lessons here and do our best to keep comments civil, okay? Mike, I'm just gonna tip my hand in the very beginning here and say, I think this one's a wobbler. I don't know if this is justified conduct or not. I can see it going both ways. I don't like it, for sure, from lots of angles. Uh, but I will say that the deputy shows up here to what he ostensibly believes is a domestic violence incident or an argument that's getting out of hand. And these kind of DV incidents are, are really seriously dangerous. And so, you know, he's right to be concerned. Absolutely. You know, it sounds almost cliche at this point, um, but it's true. DV calls are extraordinarily dangerous because, as I've said before, you have two people with very passionate feelings uh, about each other, maybe against each other. And then in a normal DV, not this case, obviously, but in a normal DV, you show up and frequently those passions are turned on to you. And now you're the bad guy and they unite to to, you know, to give you a hard time. Uh, in this case, that that doesn't appear to be the case, at least not in the moment. But I got to say, this officer was called there. He was told by people in the office. And then this lady that, look, there's a fight. It's getting bad. Need to get up there. She gives him the apartment number. So as far as where he was and why was he there, all those bases are covered. Um, I, I think perhaps, you know, I'll get to this more later, but I think perhaps waiting for another unit, I might have done that. Not that it would have affected the outcome of this particularly, but if you can wait and get one more person there, uh, that's a better way to do things in my opinion. There was some kind of a narrative as well that he, that the officer, the deputy went to the wrong apartment, that this was a wrong apartment call. That's not the case. You notice that she said 1401 is where this disturbance is happening and the deputy went to 1401. Now, now she could have been wrong in that. That is possible. Again, I haven't seen that sussed out in the news. I ha I, and, and I don't have access to discovery for the court cases that's going on here. I have not been retained by either side in terms of the lawsuit, okay? So I don't have any inside baseball on this one, but he did show up to the place where he was told to go. I wanna stop here and talk about this, this approach. And Mike, from a policing perspective, I hate this kind of corner unit here because no matter which side he goes to, he is in a bad spot. So as a general rule, officers wanna be on the knob side rather than on the hinge side because that exposes them to less problems as the door opens. However, here on the knob side, you have basically nowhere to go but over the railing. And so given all of that, I, I kind of think my preference would be to be on the hinge side, the side that he's on as we stop the frame here, but there's no good answers. Yeah, if you go over to the, act, uh, excuse me, I can't talk today. If you go over to the Active Self-Protection podcast uh, on the app or, or wherever you listen to podcasts, go back and find the C Sergeant Craig Johnson episode. He was a San Diego County Sheriff's deputy who went in to uh, arrest a suspect with a partner. They were met with gunfire through the door. And because he was in a very similar situation to this, he ended up being trapped up there. The deal with that one was they were on a second story balcony. There was no wall. Like here we have a wall to that. There was no wall. There was a railing there and a railing where we see this railing. And he ended up on the other side of it and couldn't get out of there for that reason. So I, I think... You know, if you're walking up to a house, a single family home, you're looking for cover on your way up in case things go bad. So a tree, a car, whatever. In this case, there's no cover anywhere to be found. So you need to start thinking about, okay, where's my escape route? How can I get the heck out of Dodge if this goes really poorly? So in this case, I'm going to opt for the hinge side in this setup every time I'd opt for the hinge side. As bad as it is, I don't want to be trapped, pinned down by gunfire by being on the other side of that. Now, some may disagree with me, but that's just how I would have handled this. I do think here too, the deputy listens for a minute. He doesn't just come up and bang on the door. He sits and listens. I think that was good intel right there. Like, what's going on here? I don't hear any yelling right now. I don't hear any screaming. I don't hear things breaking. I don't hear anybody needs me. So, okay, I can slow my roll a little bit. And instead, you know, he does knock on the door pretty hard. I will say that he identifies himself twice. He says, sheriff's office in a very loud voice. Now, that doesn't guarantee that the person on the other side of the door hears that it's the sheriff's office, okay? But he did that. He will end up doing that twice, banging on the door, saying it is the sheriff's office, come out, come and answer the door, it's the sheriff's office. Now you're gonna hear here from inside the apartment, there was some inaudible words, but then he hears police, okay? So at some point, this guy knows what's going on. Now, now listen, I, from everything I've heard, this airman was an exemplary, uh, you know, Air Force enlisted person. He was an exemplary kid and uh, okay, I'm, I'm just gonna say, part of the problem here, I'm not blaming this kid for what happened, but, but again, never answer the door with a gun in your hand. If you feel like it's dangerous outside, don't open the door. 
If you're worried, wait a minute, the cops might be here, and but I don't know if it is the cops and it could be somebody who is you know, presenting as police officers, don't open the door. Call 911 and ask them, is there an officer outside my door? Here's my address. Is there, an, is there a deputy or an officer outside my door? They'll tell you, yes, there is a deputy outside your door. He is dispatched. Please go outside and meet the deputy. No problem. Tell the deputy that I'm coming outside and I'm unarmed. Put the gun down and go outside. Or go old school, Mr. Robinson's Neighborhood, old SNL reference for you old people, go get your colonoscopy scheduled, uh, and, and just, who is it, right? Through the door and, and see, again, well, it's the sheriff's office. Show yourself through my people so that I can verify it's you. You might go, no, piss off, I'm not gonna do that because you'll shoot me through the door. I'm gonna call dispatch then and verify that it's you. But, but at any rate, don't answer the door with a gun in your hand, even if you're justified to do so. He's, he's okay to own guns. He's okay to have a gun in his possession. But we've seen so many of these go so badly. It's just terrible tactics. So Mike, I'm just, I, I think we're okay to tell people, don't do this. Yeah, I don't have a lot to add to that. We talked about this, John. We talked about this on more than one occasion. Look, is it your right to go to the door of your home with a firearm in the United States of America in the year of our Lord 2024? Yeah, it's, you can do it. You absolutely can do it. People will ask me, hey, Mike, can I do this as it relates to self-defense? And I'm like, yeah, you can. Doesn't make it a good idea. Um, and all, all your rights and all your lefts are not going to mean a bit of difference if an officer misinterprets what you're saying and shoots and kills you. That officer might get fired. That officer might go to jail. That's not going to bring you back. So we're, we're beseeching you. We're begging you. Don't do this. All the things that John said make sense. I want to talk about a tactics piece here real quick, John. So the, the, the problem here in part is... Um, there's one of two things going on, one of three things going on inside this apartment. One is um, there's no fight, there's nothing going on. Okay, fine, I can wait in that event. Two, they're arguing or they're yelling loudly at each other. Okay, well, that's fine. No one's being killed right now. I could sit here and wait for backup to show up, right? Or three, it's very quiet in there because one of the two people is bleeding to death. Um, so if I can't verify that there's nothing going on, um, I'm gonna wanna knock and I'm maybe gonna wanna knock before backup gets there. It's suboptimal to be sure, but, you know, we saw a video where the cops basically watched someone get murdered right in front of them and ran and hid behind a car. So there has to be a sort of middle ground there that you got to reach. So this is something that's good to think through before you get that, especially the part about where to stand under these circumstances. And, and listen, he's going to come knock on the door real loud. Sheriff's office, open the door. Sheriff's office, open the door. But of course, he doesn't want to stand in front of the door because he's worried about the guy shooting him through the door. And that's a reasonable fear because that happens. So he's identified himself twice. Now, again... I get it, you, you, because as the guy on the other side of the door, he's gonna say, but I can't see him because my people doesn't go over to that side. So he's announcing sheriff's office, but I can't see him through my people. And, and the answer here is not to open a, a door with a gun in your hand. And a gun in your hand is going to be seen as much more threatening than a gun in a holster. So if a handgun is your home defense gun of choice, have it in a holster. He's got pants on, put a belt on, put a, put a holster on, stick that gun in the holster. Uh, and again, though, I, I think, does he have a right to be doing what he's doing? Well, you can be dead right about a lot of things. And I do think that the officer did identify himself multiple times and, and there were other patterns for this. So is the officer doing anything wrong to this point? I don't think he is, Mike. I think he's handling this one as best he can, given the circumstances. Yeah, he's he kind of given a turd sandwich, and he's got to take a bite of it. And I think I'm, I'm fine with everything he's done up to this point. We're going to get to the next point, which is when the young man answers the door. Um, and we're going to see here in a moment that there's things that we can't be sure of, we can't possibly see because the camera doesn't catch them. Um, but it, this is going to be, as John said at the top, this is one of the biggest wobblers I've ever seen because you can see it from both sides of the argument. You can see this young man, hey, someone's banging on my door. I look out, I don't see anyone. I'm going to go investigate with a gun in my hand, um, which we've asked everyone not to do, but that's what he did. And from the officer's perspective, hey, it's going to take this kid uh, less than a second to get that gun up and on target. So I, I think at the end of the day, we want to see officers with enough confidence in their marksmanship, with their tactics, that you can... Even though it's not required, he can at least give a challenge. Drop it. Something real quick. Um, the, the other issue here is once you've got your gun up and out, which sadly is the appropriate response for the deputy, now it's really hard for him to see what's going on in the suspect's hand. So this is a very complicated problem. And sometimes in life and sometimes in police work uh, and in self-defense, 
there isn't as bright a line as we would like there to be when it relates to stuff like this. Like, was this justified conduct or not? And John and I, we always discuss these beforehand, and we agree. We can see arguments on both sides, 100%. Um, and we wouldn't want to be on the jury for this, and we wouldn't want to be the, the prosecutor or the defense attorney if it comes to that, because this is really, it's a hard problem, and it's it's hard to say what's right. And and again, he hasn't raised the gun up at the officer. So the, the comparison I know people are going to make, we recently did one out of Surprise, Arizona, a guy that had, had a shotgun and an officer shot him inside his home. But that guy was raising the shotgun up when the officer opened fire on him. When he made the decision to fire, he was raising the shotgun up and pointing it at the officer or moving to point it at the officer. We don't see that here. So that is a significant difference in facts, okay? And because of those differences, that's a big deal. Now on the other side of the fence, of course, you can say, well, wait a minute, he can raise that gun and shoot the officer in under a quarter second and the officer will not be able to respond in time. So he sees the gun, perceives a deadly threat to himself and responds to protect his own life because he perceives that as a deadly force. And, and that's a threat and that's possible. I just wish that the officer had more confidence here, Mike, in order to issue a command to drop it or, or to say, I'm good enough that I can beat this guy even though he has a gun in his hand. Another thing, John, is we don't get to see what the officer sees. That's true of all of these badge cams. The officer has a far wider, uh, deputy I should say, has a far wider field of vision than the camera will allow for, and he can see things clearer than you can on the tape. I say that to say this, what we don't see is when he initially opens the door, and there's no reports yet for us to read, so I can't possibly know this, when the young man, the airman, opens the door, he may have opened it with his left hand and had the gun up and aimed at a sort of a, um, we call it bent elbow position, but imagine bringing your, your elbow to your side, bending your elbow to, to point and having a gun in that hand. He could have been doing that. We don't know. If he had been doing that, then I would say it's less of a wobbler and the deputy just reacted to what he saw. Um, but again, we don't get to see that. We don't have him read the report. There's no report to read yet, so we don't know for sure. And I'm gonna say at the end of the day, I don't like what happened here. He didn't He didn't issue the kid any commands, didn't give him an opportunity to drop it, though, though again, he might well have had a gun legally in his hand. Now the officer identified himself. And so is it reasonable for the guy to come to the door with a gun in his hand. It's it's seemingly unreasonable because he had so many other options at, at his disposal in order to do things much more safely. So I don't like this. I I, I hate every bit of it. Is it, is it criminal? I, I can't tell you that. I can't tell you which one that is purely from the video evidence. I, I'd have to see all of the investigation, all of the discovery, all of the interviews and those kinds of things. And I'm sure that this deputy feels terrible. This young man that died is a, supposedly a fine human being but supposedly was, you know, had a bright career with uh, special forces in the Air Force. And that sucks. I think that, that could he have done better on this one? I'm not blaming him for what happened, but I, I just want all of us who are private citizens, hear me yet again, do not come to the door and open it with a gun in your hand, period and full stop. From the officer's perspective, please, if you are supremely competent and therefore supremely confident in your own skills, then, you can give yourself that half second to issue the command to see what happens, to hope that he drops the gun. Uh, and, and there's a difference between can I shoot this guy right now and must I shoot this guy right now. And the higher your skill set, the more gap there is between those that you can maybe save someone's life rather than have to shoot them because you don't have the skills not to. So the fortunate thing here, dear viewer, is that the good news, if there is any to be taken out of this, is that there will be a jury and or a judge at some point um, possibly to look at all of this stuff and they will have access to all the video, maybe surveillance video that we didn't get to see from inside the house. Maybe uh, the deputy's testimony as to what he saw the moment the door opened. So hopefully justice can be served one way or the other in this case, but this is one where John and I agree that we just can't give you a bright line answer as to whether this was justified conduct or not. But the good news is someone will have all the info and get that information. And let's hope that um, this agency can maybe up their training just a little bit uh, to help these officers and deputies cover their ass.